it's a, um, a pleasure to be, even though I'm here in Berkeley, a pleasure to be speaking with you all today. I um, first visited Providence when, I don't know, five years ago, and I really loved what it had to offer as a walkable city and, and, and more especially a unique place, very much what we um, aspire to achieve when we talk about placemaking in our urban design projects. And, and more personally, my um, niece just started at Brown this semester, and I know she's a big fan of the city. Um, I, can, I can very much understand why it's important knowing the city to preserve the character you have, but also to be able to grow responsibly and sustainably to ease the housing demands. That we're in, these are demands that we're seeing nationwide, um, unfortunately. So at, you know, at, at Opticos, we believe that providing more of, of this housing that we call missing middle housing is one solution of many that are needed. Um, so it's not like the be all and end all, but um, you know, I just wanted to present you a little bit more about what, what is missing middle housing and then share a little bit of our projects. But before I do that, I would just wanted to start off with a poll. You know, normally I'm in an audience and I can like ask questions and have people raise their hands, but um, this is kind of nice because you can kind of see the results in um, real data. So throughout the course of the presentation, there'll be um, a few poll questions and this will keep people on their feet. So um, I think we could start with the first first poll question. If it, let's see, we're testing out to see if this works. It doesn't look like it's going to be possible tonight, unfortunately. So we'll have to do sort of live Q&A style. Okay, all right. Um, so I, yes, okay. Um, let me see. Uh, I will go on. The first question was just trying to understand my audience a little bit and understanding how many people are um, A, in the design or construction industry and B, um, who have even heard of missing middle housing before. But I'm gonna go on the assumption that it's a mix and mix on both. So, um, you know, I'm not necessarily talking to a group of all just planners, but people who are just interested in housing and the topic and, and um, you know, what we can do for this that still keeps sense of community. So um, I wanna make sure I'm sharing my, my correct screen. Do you see just one slide right now? Is that correct? We do, Alex, what's inside is what we see. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so first, just a little bit about what we'll cover. And I think I talked about this briefly. It's, you know, why are we having this discussion? What is the, the more of the specifics of the problem that we're seeing? What is missing middle housing? Um, you know, definition that has multiple meanings, uh, and then talk a little bit about where and um, what building types this represents, share some examples of our work and other people's work, and then how do, how do we get over these barriers and actually get this kind of housing implemented in our communities? So again, wh why, why are we having this discussion and why is, it, why is this important? What, what's created this issue? Um, you know, what we know is that we have shifting um, household demographics, demographics and a lot of the households are single people. And that was gonna actually be another one of my questions of how many in the audience live alone or um, just as another single person versus like multiple people or, or the, what we consider the, you know, nuclear family. It seems like things are shifting away from that based on, on a lot of these statistics. Additionally, um, you know, people are looking for walkability and this doesn't have to be necessarily in a big city. It could be in a medium sized community or even a small community. But what what walkability means is that you have something to walk to. And usually that's some sort of neighborhood main street. In order to have a main, neighborhood main street, you really need to have some sort of, um, you know, mass numbers of people or, or a critical mass of people to make what those retail actually um, viable. And, oh, and one thing I just wanna say is like this, this demand for walkability, as you can see sort of spreads both from millennials to the baby boomers who might be downsizing and feeling like they less wanna be in their cars. And you, we, again, I think we um, do a lot of work with AARP and see a big demand for this. Um, how, and as we all know how much, how expensive the housing is going up, but, but income is not necessarily matching it. And so more, than, more and more people are spending more on their housing costs. 
And on, on top of this, you know, with um, with COVID and the pandemic, we've seen these shifts even broader spread in that people are kind of moving out of some of these bigger urban centers and, you know, um, going to these smaller communities where they know they can work, work remotely or look for other jobs. And so these are lists of some of the communities that we've been actually doing work directly in, and we do work all over the country. So, you know, again, it's like not just necessarily a big city um, issue. And what what we know, and again, we do a lot of coding work and what what we see is like so much of the um, communities, particularly since World War Two, have been zoned for just to allow for single family zoning. Um, so that means you can only have one dwelling unit per parcel. And that hasn't always historically been the case. So this just makes the demand for housing, you know, more challenging. And all of these items combined have, have given us a reason to think we have to think outside the box. We have to come up with some more tools um, to solve to solve this housing crisis issue. So again, um, missing middle housing is something that we feel is one solution um, to helping ease, ease the issue. So I don't know, this is a, um, a graphic that uh, gets around a lot. Um, we see it on other people's websites, which we're really excited about. So we know the message is getting out. It's basically our definition of missing middle housing is that it's a house scale building that that has more than one unit in it. So it looks like a single family house has it has you know more than one unit and 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 it's in a walkable a walkable neighborhood meaning that within the quarter mile or half mile ped shed there are things that you would want to walk to. So um, for example when I say house scale this is an example of um, of a of a building that looks like a house looks like a big mansion but it actually has um, three units in it. And, um, you know, missing, it, it's also, a lot of times people refer to missing middle in the economic, not just in the form and scale way that we're talking about it, but we also talk about it in terms of the income level. Like, um, it's not the, the subsidized affordable, but it's the people who, you know, have some money and are just housing challenged, don't have a whole, you know, and which is probably the majority of Americans at this point. Um, so, um, we're looking to to avoid to deliver affordability by design, and sometimes we also call that attainability. Um, and then it's missing because so little of this housing type of you know again that you may have seen a lot of in pre World War II before the cars really took off and Euclidean zoning set in, meaning like single family zoning. Less than ten percent of the housing units have been that are built have been at this um, housing type. So, um, you know, we say it's missing, but it's also that if you look around your community, you, you're very likely to see it specifically in a lot of the old historical neighborhoods, again, that were built pre-World War II and this housing type was actually super common. So, you know, we, we go all over the country documenting um, certain areas where we work and, and just finding examples of this. So, you know, here's an example. Here's some examples in Boise, Idaho. Um, also in, in, in California, there's quite a few. Um, again, this one's in San, San Luis Obispo. Um, and, you know, I did a little, um, uh, you know, work of sleuthing around. I'm sorry, this picture in the bottom right is not Providence. But what I found really interesting was that like these two in the middle are side by side. And if, one way we can always tell about whether something is missing middle is looking at the meters. Um, and this house on the side um, on the right has three meters where the one on the left has one meter. So you have a single family home right next to what is a, what is a triplex. Um, and then I also found some examples of duplex stacked and you know another one is a triplex just again based on the meters. And all of these look, you know, you unless you're like looking super closely at addresses and meters or number of trash cans, you, you'd be hard pressed to know how many units are in this building. You think, oh, one. Um, it's actually really important to talk about where, where this is most successfully located because it's not a one size fits all locations. I mean, this type of housing is most desirable and works best 
when it's distributed throughout a block with single family homes that is you know not necessarily in a suburban context but as more of like an infill that's near some sort of um, main street or neighborhood commercial um, within a walking distance and then um, additionally um, another area that we find that it works you know is is that transition zone if on the far left here you have the single family homes the yellow is kind of showing how it makes a good transition between that and the main street commercial um, so you know another um, issue is just that um, historically you know um, neighborhoods were very integrated in terms of housing type and commercial. And what we're finding now is that, um, you know, we, we're wanting to, to deliver these sort of ones that are more, have more diversity. And, but really because of the way the building industry has gone at, at big scale, what's happening is a sort of a monoculture of housing types. And that's really not benefiting um, walkable neighborhoods or diversity of housing choice that we know that we need. Um, and so this is an example of, of, a, of a, a community, and I think I'll talk a little bit later that we've been working on in, um, outside of Omaha, Nebraska, and all of these houses are multifamily, um, but it looks like single, single family neighborhood, and it has you know, units that are one bedrooms up to three bedrooms. So um, you can have single people living with families or big families needing to live together. Um, so I just, um, in, in giving a little bit more of a background, wanted to tell you a little bit more about what, what you know, from this diagram, you can kind of see there's a range of types. Um, and I'm gonna focus on somewhat of the lower end today, because I feel like those are the ones that for infill projects and are gonna be the most successful. Um, at, at this time, if we're thinking about this as like an infill community rather than like a ground up community. And um, so one of the types that I'm sure everybody's been hearing a lot of discussion about because nationwide it certainly has been, um, you know, talked about and a lot of states have been implementing, you know, legislation to like allow it by right. I know California across the state has allowed it by right anywhere that there's a single family house. and. The idea is, you know, it's it's called an accessory dwelling unit, but you also know it by names like carriage house or um, a, a in law unit or a granny flat. Um, so there's lots of opportunities, and it's definitely something that we see me more and more people needing demand for. Whether their kids need to live at home because they can't afford housing, or they have an elderly parent that they need to take care of, or a caretaker needs to live. So, you know, this this is one sort of the easy. Um, easy step into the entrance of like getting this housing talk really more across the board. But we'd say this is really again on the very lower end of what we would call missing middle and it's the first step in. So some other examples are um, duplexes and these come in a series of types that could be side by side. We showed an example of one that was stacked that was in Providence. Um, but I think what is really important to know about all duplexes is that again, that they're, they're house scale, they're attached and they have some sort of, um, still have some sort of open space. And I think why that is important to say is, here's an example of a side by side and one that's sized appropriately for, you know, the adjacent neighborhoods or adjacent single family homes is that we're not trying to say that it's simply two units on a lot, that a duplex is very much different from this scenario and I think sometimes that people get a little concerned, particularly about the building on the right, that their single family neighborhoods are just gonna be jam packed um, with, with building types. So it's just a, a kind of an important distinction. And that often comes down to a lot of um, code, code writing and how, how, you know, how it's written into the code to be allowed. Another one that is really works um, well and incrementally over time is the multi generational house. So you can imagine that the house on the right was a, you know, a single family home and over time, the needs have grown say I want to have a separate zone for my my parents um, that might be in the yellow, but then you also want to have like um, 
something that either you can rent out and make some additional income, or you have your kids that are adults that need a place to live. So you built um, a one bedroom carriage house over the garage. So this is an example of how, how um, single family housing can adapt over time to allow for some of this housing and also adjust for these needs that people have of diverse housing types. Um, another type as we move up the scale is a fourplex. And you know, fourplexes come in many different sizes and scales. And this is on the smaller side of a fourplex. So it's probably like four or one bedrooms. Um, but you can kind of um, see that again, it's still within that house scale um, size of adjacent neighbors. And, and again, talking about the idea that a fourplex, again, is really about four attached units. Um, and these are like all different examples, like architecturally all over the country, you can see them and they just are, you know, locally based for their, for their architectural aesthetics. I think when we think about allowing four units on a lot, this is what people get concerned about maximizing out the lot and having four detached units. And then really, again, it's not, it's not so much the scale and size is not fitting in um, with the adjacent neighborhoods. You know, something like this is what I think people have a little bit of a fear about allowing in the single family neighborhoods. Not to say that this isn't appropriate in some places, but you know, where we're really advocating for when we talk about um, adjusting, you know, certain single family zones to allow for more um, multifamily, it's not necessarily this and that and the, in those lower areas of transition. Um, I'm sure probably all of you have seen um, something along the lines of like a bungalow court or a cottage court. And this is a type that really draws a lot of um, enthusiasm, um, particularly among seniors or people that have other, you know, want to build a community within their family. So because, because, you know, here you are, you have single detached houses, but you have this shared green, you get to know your neighbors, you have the serendipity of running into each other. And in some ways, it's actually a lot safer because you have a lot more eyes on, on the house and in the community. So I, there's, again, a growing demand for this um, kind of housing um, type. And, you know, usually it's like you have some shared space, but you still have a little bit of personal private space to make your own as well. Um, and that was an example in, in California. And this one's also in California. Um, it's in Pasadena and it's um, at a larger scale. And once it gets to be more than one or two lots big, we usually call it like a pocket neighborhood. Um, and so you can see from this kind of plan what that, what that configuration might look like and how many houses you know, or units that might be. Again, what they all have in common though is that they're um, surrounded around a green that brings people together and they've sort of aggregated the parking over to one area rather than distributing it throughout to each house um, individually. Um, so, you know, a lot of what is needed to make um, this happen is um, a little bit of smaller living units, not the like to 2,500, 3,000 square foot house. And what you're giving up in size, you're sort of gaining in community and also, um, you know, some shared amenities, like you might have a common house or you um, might have like a gar a community garden. So some of those things are a trade off that that people are actually looking for, particularly as they're downsizing or just starting out at a family. So um, that's a little bit about the typologies, um, just wanting to share, you know, what the examples that I have largely shown to, to right now have all been um, uh, historic examples and infill of pre, pre World War II. But um, just wanting to share that, you know, it is, it is possible it, um, to get this built and um, just trying to share some examples of recently built ones in varying parts across the country. This is this is actually in um, Healdsburg, California, and it's in a it's in a you know what we'd say is a working working class neighborhood um, in 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 wine country. Um, there's are uh, mobile homes on one side of it and some sort of track homes on the other. And the developer that we worked with had 
um, is a landscape architect by background, but so he he was really interested in the um, you know keeping a sense of the green and um, a community, and he had bought what are basically seven lots, um, and instead of you know just individually dividing them into seven lots, he took the initiative to sort of center them around a green and you know basically create this community where you have eight single family homes with four ADUs. Um, and this just recently um, finished construction um, and pretty much all but one units have sold in two weeks. And you know I think initially he had hoped in this one to get some more you know multifamily units in it as opposed to all detached, but he ran into hurdle with the zoning. And um, the unfortunate thing about Healdsburg is that they only issue 30 building permits a year, which you can understand can make it very difficult to, to build um, you know, within, within the community. So part of his costs were just having to hold the property over, I think we started this project in 2016 and it was just built, um, you know, finished construction, like, or just went on the market like two months ago. Um, but this is this is an example of what it looks like. And the other good thing about kind of aggregating the buildings is that he was able to build for like three quarters of the costs or um, that uh, normally built in 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 Healdsburg, California. So that was also a help in in bringing in the price points at lower than a single family in the area. Um, this is another, I think a lot of the projects that I'm showing you are in like um, mid to smaller size communities. This is another one in, in Missoula, Montana, and the developer was saying similar story. We just are really having a hard time bringing attainable housing price points to, um, to our community. And they were like largely single family home builders. And they asked us to see what they could do with it. We could do with this one parcel that is up in the, um, the yellow portion up here where it says site location. Um, and so, you know, what we looked at was um, a series of diverse housing type um, that included not, we had interspersed some single family along with, um, you can see there's some uh, pocket neighborhood over here, um, some duplexes and fourplexes. And another, another characteristic that we think is really helpful in, both, you know, creating a sense of community, but also in building, um, you know, a, a attainable prices is that you're mixing, you're mixing your for sale and rental. And it's not, again, it's not a monoculture of house type or, or um, for sale or rental. And um, it just brings a diverse spectrum to the, to the market. Um, I think that this was the other project that I mentioned um, earlier, that the one that's in um, Papillion, where um, it's all rental house. This one is, is all rental housing, um, but does have a range in size and a range in rent where it's like, I think it starts at like just under $1,000 rent for a one bedroom and then up to 3000 for a three bedroom. Um, I think one of the things that really makes this project successful that is necessary to talk about is how people approach parking, because this developer, like, recognize, I think he really recognized that in order to create a community, um, he had to not have a big, big areas of parking lots or um, just tuck under garages. And so he was willing to take a risk, even though you can see it's a little bit, um, it, is, it is a suburban location, but we felt that there was enough with the, with the natural park and things that to create this sense of walkable um, area. But at the same time, understand that people are gonna need their cars. A car because of its location, not necessarily near public transportation. Um, and so what our approach was, was that every unit had at least one um, garage spot and then the rest, which was like, I think there was a parking ratio of 1.75 per unit were actually on street parking, like you might park in a neighborhood. Um, so this is, and these two, this is, he's built phase, a first 140 units and he's on their way of building the next like 200 units. It's overall, it's like 40 acres or 40 to 50 acres um, and something like um, almost 700 units. 
Um, if, if here's an example on the other end of the spectrum um, where it's in, it's in an urban environment, it's in Tempe, Arizona, and um, they, this developer was really interested in sort of pushing the envelope and saying, we want to build um, a mobility rich community without cars for pedestrians. We want to give them lots of other options. And so this is like right on the rail line and it's 11 acres. Um, and, you know, they really had a concept that there were a lot of naysayers for, but I think what um, is really um, striking is the fact that they were able to get this project entitled in one year. Um, and so the fact that, you know, you're in Arizona, you think there'd be a lot of pushback from the community about having a place with no cars, but the demand was such that, you know, we, that there was enough belief in the need for it that, um, you know, it got through and the first phase was already like over um, leased. So we know it to be successful. It just took a little bit of belief. And part of the features that you can see is by not having to have parking lots, we're able to create these pretty amazing courtyard spaces um, for the residents with lots of amenities. There's like bookable spaces, and um, you know that they can use for overnight guests or they can have meetings in. There's a whole commercial center right at the trail line. So it's a bit of a, it's a TOD development. Um, and so, you know, we really worked with the climate um, to create a sense of architecture, but keep the buildings very simple so that the construction costs are, aren't sky high. Um, and so this one is just coming out of the ground now um, for phase one. And it's all, this one too is all rental units. Um, here's a more photorealistic um, rendering of the main Paseo um, with that would not have any cars, but has some amenities. There's a co-working space and a cafe and a, and a grocery center along with on the left is sort of a community center building. Um, I'm wanting to share this project, which is in um, Buena Vista, Colorado, because um, it's what's interesting about it. It's a we. This is not a project that we worked on, but we are currently working with this developer, who's also a, um, a house builder, and they they are very tied to the sense of community building, community as well. And so they they really wanted to do a pocket neighborhood that had you know smaller homes at attainable prices, but had like lots of shared spaces and they are modular house builders. And so these were all factory built homes that um, you know, was coming in at a, a point of entry price point that was very reasonable um, for first time home buyers in the community. So this one, this whole um, community is also all sold out. Um, so, so now I've shown you all these examples of, you know, told you a little bit about what it is um, and shown you some examples of built projects um, but I will say there, there are barriers and there are things that make it challenging to build this housing type, given, you know, financing and um, construction costs, although this is still more affordable to build than, um, you know, a single family home. But so I want to kind of walk you through a little bit of some of those barriers and some of the things that we've been doing to um, sort of help communities um, overcome some of these barriers and really um, encourage um, this housing type. I think I think the first step, and this is you know what we're doing right now, is kind of sharing what is missing middle housing and communicating with different communities across um, across the country about why is there a need for this and why is it a solution. And some of the things you know, if we if if I'd been there presenting in person, I would have had a better opportunity to go and photo document some of your examples, but another next step that we do is just walk people around their neighborhoods and show like, look, this housing type is all over, all over your community. And, and people often say, yeah, but it's in a really expensive neighborhood. But the point is that it wasn't always an expensive neighborhood and it's become more and more desirable. So the idea is that it's not, it's not to be something to be super scared about. And actually in some places it's very desirable. And just by showing it, you really kind of make people less afraid of what it is. Um, another, another really important aspect of it is just building these um, group alliances. So 
in order to get it implemented. So like we do a lot of work with AARP because they're one of our biggest advocates of this work, but then they too also partner with groups like United Way and Habitat for Humanity and just sort of form this advocacy group that can really speak to both the community and to um, like local planning agencies um, and building departments about why, why do they support it? Why is it important? And just get interest and um, discussion going about it. Because, you know, one of, as mentioned earlier, one of the biggest barriers is just the fact that so much of our, um, of our zoning is for single family zoning in residential districts. And, you know, this is not, you, people can say, well, why don't you just build it in the multifamily? But the scale at which it's at, it just doesn't pencil out for the multifamily zones. And again, it's almost like we need this transition zones between the multifamily and the single family that would allow for these types that are somewhere in the two to six, um, two to six unit uh, count that look still fit and look like single family housing. And it's kind of what, what we call incremental um, density increase. We really like to stay away from the word from density because people freaks people out. But again, when you just keep saying like, well, these not these amount of people will help support, um, you know, what you want to walk to and think of the number of people that you're housing as opposed to using the kind of more generic word density. And, you know, I talked a little bit earlier about why what, what is a duplex and what is a fourplex versus like just two units and four units. And it's also um, kind of a really important to build successful projects that um, the, the form and the type are so, given some sort of um, regulation around them. So um, that you don't get necessarily, there's just four detached that fill up the lot in the way. So that, then that's what people are, are really nervous about saying, well, this is a big box is gonna go, you know, three stories tall and fill up the whole lot. So, um, you know, we do a lot of work on form-based codes. We're not necessarily saying that that, that is the um, only answer. Um, things like objective design standards are important too to, to sort of overcome nimbyism um, and just say like, this is regulated as is, there's not any kind of, um, uh, you know, I want to say descriptive or it's it's really prescriptive as opposed to um, you know allowing to have their non-objective standards basically. Um, another really successful method for getting people to open up to this housing type are to do pilot projects. Um, this is a particular cottage court in. Um, Washington State, I believe it's in Bellevue. No, I'm sorry, it's it's outside of um, it's outside of Seattle, but it's not Bellevue. Um, but this one, this um, neighborhood did, or it's Bellingham. This neighborhood did not have um, an ability to build cottage courts because the lot sizes were just that that this would require were just too small. That they had a minimum lot size that regulated it that just really would not work for for something a development like this. And so they agreed to do this as a pilot project. And if it received a lot of, you know, no resistance and people seemed to like it, then they had created this sort of um, test code for it. And so after a certain amount of years, um, that code became um, a code across the city that um, allowed this kind of um, cottage court developments to, to be located anywhere. Um, Another kind of big hurdle because of how the building industry goes is that there um, has to do with like whether or not something is under the residential code versus the building code, the IBC. Um, and a lot of house builders either fall in the IRC or they fall into IBC. And so when we have a small building that is for an, a that is built more like a house, um, the challenge is that the builders who can build single family homes aren't familiar with a lot of the codes that are necessary. And there are extra things around sprinklers and fire separation that are required. And so there's like kind of a lack of capacity and understanding about that. But also um, there's, we sort of believe that there's just, it's a little bit overkill the amount. I mean, when you can build a duplex and under the IRC, we're really pushing for the idea that units up to six 
can um, fall under the IRC. And in fact, um, we found out that just recently Memphis has started to, um, their planning department is talking to their building code um, department about um, creating a special code for units up to six. So that idea is gaining some traction um, in various communities. Um, another way to just um, think about this is like thinking about how how do you take a disadvantage and turn it into um, an opportunity? And this project is an example of a new sort of a way of looking at a townhouse. So the round the perimeter are your kind of conventional townhouses that are kind of stacked side by side and you just have small amount of windows at the front and back. Um, but it also given the lot size left the developer with these kind of unruly sort of leftover spaces in the middle and they came to us and said, what, what can we do with this? How can we think creatively um, about, about this area um, and, and make an advantage and provide some additional housing? And so what we looked at was a precedent was um, in, in England and particularly in London, they have these sort of alleys of carriage houses with homes over them that are called muse, muse style housing. And we thought that that could work really effectively you know, backing up to these alleys, but have a pedestrian network. So you can see all these these yellow areas are the pedestrian network. So this was really just taking the townhouse style and turning it on its side um, and, and, and making it fit, but also getting the advantage of, now you have all this, you know, connectivity of pedestrian ways and public space. So really took like a design challenge and turn it up into opportunity. The other, um, Thing that worked really well in making these housing, you know, really attainable. So they, this was in a larger development called Daybreak. It's outside of Salt Lake City. Was that the houses were um, able to be built very simply, and so that really helped the construction cost. So we used a small footprint um, with simple boxes, but allowed the like public space to really be what sang. And so you can see in this picture. Um, of, of what, what that space and feels like. And this was just early on, right at the beginning, um, end of construction, um, right before they were occupied. But the idea that, again, you have this sort of walking pedestrian alley and these houses were able to come in at under $200,000 at the time, which was the most affordable um, housing unit in this, in this larger 200 acre development. Um, I, I talked a little bit about um, parking and why is it so important? So um, to think a little bit creatively about it and it goes the spectrum of, you know, maybe we have a community without any cars, but then maybe there's an opportunity to think creatively when we do need cars and not say that everyone is gonna not have a car. So, you know, can we limit it down to like one to one and a half? Um, I think it's just thinking that like, in order to make things attainably price point, we really need them to be, um, you know, provide spaces that are more for people than for cars. So really putting the priority on the housing over the parking and figuring out how we can make that work. I know where we live here in Berkeley, like many places have garages, but I would say only 10% even use them for car parking. So we know that it's doable even in neighborhood communities. Um, you know, it's just, again, this is just quickly shows um, what the challenge is with um, parking and what you're quickly giving up when you have a small lot by the amount of like, if you have to suddenly provide, you know, two parking spaces or one and a half per unit, what, what that starts to grow and look like. Um, and, uh, very quickly, just talking a little bit about affordability and equity building. Um, and I talked about how it's, it's really important to have for a diverse community to have a sense of like rental and for sale product mix um, that, that we know that people build equity through purchase. And so we also need to provide opportunities for people to buy housing and by, by making these smaller units, it's a way to get your foot, foot in the door. You know, we talk again. I talked about attainable on the barbell spectrum. There's affordable, which is is usually subsidized, which subsidized housing and definitely very needed because we're not going to be able to build these and sell them at below an AMI 
um, needed to hit these affordable price points. But at the other end of the spectrum, you know, there is the idea that we can build at a, at, at an, a market rate that is still um, affordable by design. Um, so how many of these units are needed to deliver affordability? If you think about like a single family house um, at a million dollars, if you were to build six condominiums on that same spot that is of a house scale that are, you know, 1200 feet instead of 3000 feet, you would get, you know, you get something at two thirds of the price point. So it's just a sort of an economics is one aspect of it. Um, so, you know, um, again, missing middle housing is most effective in these sort of existing but um, smaller scale neighborhoods. Um, and, and this is where we are most interested in advocating for it and where we think that most neighborhoods will be, where it can make the most impact as well. And, and short of like the attainability by private, um, you know, uh, private developers, the, the other way that we've been seeing and talking to as a model are community land trusts to help the affordability aspect of it, where the land, the price of the land is, is, is held stable. And it's not that the over time, the land, the house price will only go up so much because the price of the land itself is fixed. And you see this um, very often in like um, academic, um, like we see uh, school school administrations are buying land so that they can house their their teachers um, who can then buy a house or also at university level, it's another common one. So, you know, we're working on a project in Oklahoma City that is looking at this model um, where a nonprofit organization would buy the land and help keep the land affordable, but you're still building equity because the house does increase um, in value, just not as quickly as land speculation. So I think I went a little over, but I, that is, um, you know, the, the spectrum of the presentation. If you want to know a little bit more about missing middle housing, that we have a website that is missingmiddlehousing.com um, where it has a lot more about these types and some case studies. And But there's also um, our founder, Dan Parallax, um, recently published this book that is really very approachable and has a lot more useful detailed information. So I am uh, good for questions. Great, Alex, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate the formal introduction you've provided. Um, this is certainly a concept I'm familiar with, but it's nice to um, think about it um, holistically. Um, we've got a great audience here. I know that they won't be shy. Um, of the names I recognize, we have planners and architects and preservationists and community leaders. Um, so if you all want to start um, chatting away, feel free to add some questions. Um, I was struck by um, uh, some pictures from taken in New Orleans and probably some housing types um, inspired by New Orleans. And I think that I need to pitch an idea to my friends down there to do a tour of middle housing because so many of these um, examples uh, exist in the wild in New Orleans. Um, from the uh, shotgun doubles to the courtyard apartments. Um, so I, I need to think about pitching that idea. Um, but I wonder if you could start off by talking about, um, you know, so many of these do look like greenfield projects or large scale infill. Um, what about adaptive reuse of um, buildings that exist, um, but turning them into more, you know, multifamily, but at this middle um, scale? Can you comment on that? Sure, and I did try to start out the examples by more infill, but yes, they were pretty much all focused on new construction versus adaptive reuse, like you've mentioned. And um, I think there's a good case study in um, Dan's book of um, somebody in Portland that had taken an existing um, single family large house and turned it into a triplex. Um, and I think, you know, on his first project, he felt that, you know, he, he definitely lost money, right? So he, 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 but he felt that he had learned a lot of lessons and things that he could replicate it going forward. And think that it's a model that um, is, can it gain some speed, but I think that the challenge, that I, like what I mentioned about the IRC and the IBC is really that when you're going from a single family, you're suddenly going into the IBC, which can make it really challenging 
for a lot of um, communities. So some of our um, developers have gotten really creative and tried to figure out how to fire separate it in a way that you just have, um, like maybe a fourplex is really two duplexes attached so that each side is only like a, um, a duplex and can fall under the IRC. But I would say that is the, one of the largest hurdles is just the code of adapting for some of these multifamily, like a, a stack triplex or a fourplex. However, um, you know, another um, example are just that multi-generational house that I started to show where maybe you take the main unit and turn it into a duplex and add a carriage house. And then you have, you know, three units instead of just one, for instance. Right. I was wondering too, I, you know, I think so many of these um, designs are appealing and attractive because it's what we love about, um, you know, visiting Europe. Um, like you said, I wrote my thesis on the yeah. London news. So I'm <laughs> very familiar with um, those intimate and just uh, attractive spaces, um, but also going on vacation to Oak Bluffs on Martha's Vineyard or to Seaside, Florida, this, you know, density and scale um, that is, you know, just enjoyable. But I do always wonder about, you know, my friends who are firefighters um, and how, you know, yeah. code, code challenges are one thing, but just emergency services. Is that something that comes up in your work yeah, so I mean, I will just say that all these communities, we have to meet the code for the fire turning access and access, even that one without the cars that we showed, you know, that was like a big challenge. So we have emergency fire access, we have delivery access. Um, and so it, it, they are designed to that for that access, but it's very thoughtful and very careful so that it's not over designed on the space. So yeah, no, no building department is gonna is really lets us not meet those. Right. those build. I mean, what would be great or what we always say is like, if you look in Europe, well, they just have smaller fire trucks, right? <laughs> so we're designing for these bigger fire trucks rather than saying, well, can we get smaller fire trucks and build more intimate streets? You know, it's, it's a, it's a challenge. It's one of the biggest ones we come across. Oh, very good. I see Doug Victor. Doug, did you want to ask a question? Or maybe not. Okay, I saw his face pop up. Um, we did want some clarity. Thank you for showing uh, examples of our triple decker housing in Providence, which of mm -hmm. course is um, not unique to Providence, but definitely unique um, to this uh, neck of, of Southern New England. Um, I live in a modified um, triple decker and it's basically three flats and three single people live in them and it's very comfortable. Um, and, and so we had a, a question about codes, um, but I think Christine got to that one. Um, and I'm just trying to, to catch, make sure I've gotten all of the, the questions that are continuing to come in. Um, Doug, did I see you again? Did you wanna chime in? Um, yes, thank you. Um, I can't. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear oh, you. you can. Thank you so much. I, ju I just came in because it was on the, um, the JDA uh, meeting about redistricting, which was really, really, really important and probably has a lot to do with housing and uh, how that can move forward, equitable, equitable housing. Um, so I just, I just came in and heard about smaller fire trucks. Can we also get quieter fire trucks. In, in, in Europe, the emergency vehicles sort of sound like, wah, 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 wah. everybody knows what they sound like. In the United States, they blast us out of our houses. Yeah. So is that needed? So, and there's some evidence to, to there's some evidence that, um, that suggests that the, 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 um, the types of alarms We may have lost him there. Yeah. Um, Alex, I had another question. I wanted to yeah, ask in you. In Europe, it's different. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, thanks, Doug. Thank you. That's yes, it. these That's are all comment. related. These are all items related to our quality of life and how we live. Um, and sometimes, you know, as Alex said, we're trying um, to think of the design of the bigger part when maybe we just need to redesign the smaller part. Um, Alex. What, how does this fit in, you know, this conversation you all are leading with new urbanism, um, either formally or informally, because um, there seems to be a lot of overlap. 
Yeah, so I mean, I think this is like one component of a larger new urbanism and new urbanism is a lot about how are we looking at the urban design of the space and not just the housing units, right? Are, are we creating, are we designing for people and placemaking or are we designing for cars, right? So, and I know this is a constant conversation we have about cars and we're not saying, you know, I did show an example of a mobility rich community that doesn't have cars, but we also are designing in communities where there's some public transportation is not an option. And so we're not saying we don't need to provide for any cars. We're just saying like, we need to be really creative about how we park those cars. And like, maybe we don't need three cars for a three bedroom, things like that. So, and allowing for street parking because we know that's how most people park, but it still allows for the street. So, you know, and a lot of times the other thing about it is when we talk about placemaking, there's like a hierarchy within the development. You have a neighborhood commercial, you have an amenity or you have public spaces and you have connectivity. So that's all part of what we look for when we're, you know, whether it's an infill site or um, like just a whole new community. Um, and so that's why we're like, again, we advocate, it's not like we're saying go out in the suburbs, we think you could just put this as an infill lot in a suburb, which we don't. Um, we're just trying to expand that sort of urban um, growth, but knowing that we need to have um, neighborhood kind of commercial to make it to support it as well. Uh, and can you also talk about the um collaboration you said with AARP, I, I believe the baby boomers are the largest, most populous generation right now. My parents are boomers. Um, and so seeing how their needs change um, and how, you know, as, as you've said, this is attractive um, to boomers, but can you talk about that relationship and things you've learned from each other? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you, you know, they have this um, network called livable communities where they're trying to, you know, really um, boost what um, what kinds of amenities they need to be a livable community based on their their kind of criteria and housing is one of the biggest components of it right and and people we know there's a shortage of housing they have fixed income and things are getting only getting more and more expensive and people want to age in their neighborhoods and so the idea is like if you're in this home what are some of the things that you can do to allow for that. And so that's a lot of what we've looked at with them. And, you know, they have that book on, they have a great book out on like ADUs that they really have been, that was like the first thing they really pushed for were ADUs. And now we've been kind of like growing that idea of like, well, okay, it's not just, not just building the carriage house that might help for your caretaker or have your kid, you live there and your kids live in the main house, but are there ways to do like, you, like what you said about like, can you take a single family home and make it into a duplex? Um, can we can we also you know create a little pocket community and have a within within our existing neighborhoods and allow for that sort of um, sense of like, hey, we're all we are all taking care of each other. We have a social community built in without just having to go to the you know senior housing um, community or assisted living kind of thing. So. Um, it's, they've been really great advocates and part of it is many, you know, I feel like we get a whole lot less resistance. We, they've partnered with us to kind of get the conversation going, doing presentations like this within, you know, city planning departments and just having that understanding of like, you know, um, it's not something to be afraid of, but you have to do it um, properly. Oh, great. Um, we have a question here. Um, has your work been influenced by, um, the pandemic, you know, rethinking so many things as we are in density, density and living closely together is one of them. Um, so is that something you all have revisited? So, I mean, it's really great because the pandemic was a good test for our housing types. You know, that project that I showed in um, Omaha before, even before the pandemic, the developer was very much like, I want people to feel like they're living in a house. I don't want shared hallways. I don't want corridors. I want everybody to have their own private entry. And so, you know, that was very much what that one was built on as in addition to, and many of the single housings, they all have their own separate entries, right? So the idea is like, but yet, you know, we knew during the pandemic, we didn't want to feel completely isolated, right? So it's actually been a type that's worked really wonderfully for it because it's still supporting community, but it hasn't had us necessarily having to like be on top of each other, or have like shared spaces in elevators and hallways. So 
um, we've actually found a lot of uh, it resonated a lot and and it, and again it works very well and from the small community to the large community um, because we're not we're, it's not something that we're seeing in the like urban core per se you know so it's kind of spreading the housing out more right uh, here's a good question to think about um, if in perhaps maybe less homogenous um, communities. Uh, what really uh, ties people together other than just living in close proximity? I mean, is if is this the Melrose place for um, baby boomers or yeah. um, what else kind of, um, you know, unprogrammed things have you all witnessed um, when these communities come together? Yeah, a lot more just like collaborative eating together. So that's when people taking care of each other's pets um, you know, uh, gardening together, just, um, so, you know, you go away, you need somebody to collect your mail, you, you might need to borrow a cup of sugar, you know, so just the fact that you know your neighbors, um, and have that sort of sense, but, but, but we, like I said, we, it's, we find that's really important that we build some sort of community amenity that kind of helps prompt that, and, you know, sometimes they do market studies, like the one, um, that I showed in Tempe, you know, was it like, do you want community garden or do you want a dog park? So it just kind of depends on who you think your market is, but allowing for some of those things. And they also knew that because their units were smaller, people wouldn't be able to like um, have overnight guests as easily. So they kind of set up these sort of Airbnb units that were just for the um, residents to, to book for their guests. So oh, that's different fun. kinds of opportunities like that, yeah. And what about rules and policies, you know, as a collective of buildings or, you know, is each one really standalone? They just happen to be um, in close proximity. So it really kind of, sorry about the car alarm out there, but so they de really depends a lot on, um, you know, whether like on the, on the spectrum, you can say co-housing, for example, which you kind of create your own um, sort of shared rules and shared um, chores or activities versus like a very specific um, HOA that um, regulates like that all down to like a T um, and that the community doesn't really have as much say in. So I think like where we find the happy medium is a lot when these can be like um, a fee for, for a bigger community, maybe they're like a fee simple meaning that you have your own attached or detached house, but you're not having to like share the same roof, like worrying about roof leaks and things like that. So um, I feel like that's, a, that's the best way to make the inroad on some of this is like, how can we, how can we create these like um, share, we'll pay into HOA, but it's for like the green spaces and I still have my my space and and my parking spot, you know, or not even the parking spot because that's aggregated, but it's really just um, people I think feel um, a little bit more willing to buy into it for a start if it's set up that way. Great. Well, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, I, we really appreciate you being with us. Um, again, this is just day two of our um, housing symposium. Um, so this was a great um, session to really get the juices flowing. Um, and I hope that when you come to visit your niece at Brown, that you'll stop by and see us. Uh, and perhaps she'll want to be an intern at, at PPS during her Brown career. Um, but thank you all so much for joining us and hope you will tune in for the next symposium event tomorrow, 530. Good night.